Chapter 38, Epilogue Epilogue, Paradigm Janine looked up, hearing the footsteps on the soft grass before she heard the knock on her front door. As the tapping of knuckles on wood filtered through the house, muted by supple carpet and almost drowned out by the din of playing children, the woman in purple ran her hands down the front of her dress and paced from the bedroom into the hall, then walked across the house and down the steps to the front door. Brock! She beamed and stepped aside, holding the door wide and motioning for the tall gym leader to enter. I wasn't expecting you. She went on. Please come in. Brock nodded and crossed the threshold, trailed by a boy holding tightly to the man's pant leg. Thank you, he said warmly. I love what you've done with your hair. Blowing a hanging bang away from her face and tucking the rest of her neck length locks behind her ears, Janine shrugged. It was getting too long, she said. And Ash said it would look good shorter. She paused and knelt, looking at the boy trailing Brock. And who is this little trooper? She smiled. The boy stood barely as tall as Janine's hip, his amber eyes glinting as he looked alertly about the parlor. Grant, the child piped up. I'm five. Reaching down, Brock ran a hand through the boy's spiky brown hair. My youngest, he said. Peering very intensely about the room, Grant tugged Brock's belt. Is he here? The boy asked. I want to meet the savior. Manners, Brock chided. He turned to Janine. Sorry. He said. Quite all right, Janine answered, turning back to Grant. Ash is out writing. He should be back soon though. Did you want to go play while you wait? Grant nodded and Janine turned about, calling out, children. And waiting until a trio of faces appeared on the banister overlooking the entryway and living room. Spotting the gnarled gym leader, two of the three children's faces lit up. Uncle Brock. They cheered, running down the stairs and lining up beside their mother, the third child lagging slightly behind. Kids, this is Grant, Janine gestured to the boy, now clinging very tightly to Brock's leg. Uncle Brock brought him to visit. The tallest of the children, a girl with sparkling purple eyes, and fiery red hair stepped forward and stuck her hand towards Grant, shaking it vigorously when he he extended his own. Nice to meet you, she said with her chin held up high, the light catching an angry red cut running between her left eye and her nose. I'm Brenna. Lavina and Crystal are my sisters. She nodded to the shorter girls in turn. Don't touch Lavina or she'll punch you. The second tallest daughter, a girl whose eyes matched her mother's, gave her head a shake. I will not, Lavina chirped. Janine stepped in and smoothed out her middle daughter's golden hair while moving her away from Brenna. Girls, she said said, almost sternly, no teasing each other. Why don't you all take Grant upstairs and show him your Pokemon while we wait for father? Cheering the three girls swarmed around Brock's son, ferrying him up the stairs amidst a maelstrom of questions. Janine and Brock watched, the latter's attention focused primarily on the smallest girl who, while enthusiastically welcoming Grant to the house, lagged behind the other two. The gym leader turned to his host and cleared his throat. Brenna and Lavina sure have grown these last few years, he said. Nine and seven, Janine sighed happily. You've never met Crystal have you? She asked, motioning for Brock to follow as she lead him into the kitchen where she put a kettle on the stove and took some glasses from the cupboard. Brock slid into the chair at the kitchen table. No, he said. She looks just like Ash though, minus the black hair. It's impossible to miss the resemblance. Janine stared at the kettle. It's funny, she said. But you take Crystal outside on a sunny day and her hair looks blue. Cobalt, blonde, redhead, Brock puzzled. Janine cocked her head at him, as if to infer surprise that he hadn't yet put it together. Articuno, Zapdos, Mole Trees. You've never seen them up close? She asked. When Brock shook his head, Janine folded her arms and leaned against the stove. Once you get near enough, you see that Zapdos actually looks bright yellow, and Mole Trees is red and white. Articuno is the odd one out because she doesn't actually shine unless the sun is hitting her. Brock raised an eyebrow. Really? He said, sounding less than curious. Shrugging, Janine looked behind her back and at the kettle. Zapdos and Mole Trees both generate and emit energy, she said. Electromagnetic and thermal. Articuno on the other hand acts something like a giant and very, very powerful heats in. Her body temperature is consistently within one or two degrees of absolute zero. If she comes out of the seafoam islands, the temperature for hundreds of miles will rapidly drop 40 or 50 degrees and create storms that... She paused for a second and laughed. Oh my god, I'm starting to sound like ash. 
That's not really important. The point is that Articuno's body is so cold that to the naked eye she looks dark blue and purple if not outright black, and my daughters each seem to be taking after one of Ash's little goddesses. Coincidence? Brock asked. Eh, who knows? Janine turned up the heat beneath the kettle and then walked to the window above the sink, staring out into the sunlight and scanning the skies. Ash swears he didn't have anything to do with the similarities and I believe him. Besides, all three girls are already taking after him in other ways. Brock leaned back in his chair. Savants? He inquired. One and all, Janine nodded. And boy does it show. Brenna's already caught her third Pokémon by herself. You're kidding, Brock exclaimed. Ash gave her a Charmander for her fifth birthday, and it's already evolved into a Charmeleon. She's since caught a Growlithe, a Cyndaquil, and yesterday she caught a Houndour that gave her that cut by her eye. Lavina's not far behind, since Ash gave her a Pikachu, she's caught a Magnemite and a Volturb. Grant isn't going to be playing with a Volturb, Brock pressed. No no, the Volturb and the Magnemite stay in the Pokeballs unless Lavina's going out on Route 1. All right, Brock relaxed some. I just remembered some of the damage Ash could do back when he had a Pikachu. So does Crystal have a Pokemon yet? A Glacian, Janine nodded. Ash offered several times to take her out to catch more, but she's just holding with one for now. She smiled. So, how's the family? Jenny doing all right? Brock raised a shoulder and dropped it as Janine turned back to the stove to remove the whistling kettle. As she poured two cups of steaming tea, he sighed. She still has nightmares about Mount Moon. It was hard on her. Sorry to hear. Nearly getting eaten by monsters that ate most of your friends will do that to you I hear, even if it was a decade ago, Brock said calmly. But she's alright mostly, been focusing on the kids and getting them through their homework every night. Speaking of. He looked up from his cup of tea. I heard someone in this room who isn't me went to Saffron and studied at a very prestigious university for a few years. After Crystal was born, said the woman in purple, Ash insisted I take some time off and do something I wanted. I'd always thought about going to college and study. Something, but Huntington's made that a pretty moot point. Until Huntington's became a moot point, Brock livened up. What did you study? Thermodynamics, mostly, Janine grinned. There was some chemical engineering in there too. I mostly just took classes that looked interesting, wound up with some extra letters behind my name, wrote a few papers on this and that. The usual. She quipped. Hope all that book learning didn't make you too soft as a... Shit, Brock glanced down at his tea for only the slightest fraction of a second, but when he looked back up Janine's spot sat vacant. The gym leader flinched and spun in his chair to look behind him and, seeing no one, looked again to where the woman had just stood. He flinched a second time when the handle of a wooden spoon tapped him on the shoulder. Janine stood behind him, and tossed the spoon into the sink where it landed perfectly in a cup of utensils to be washed. Nope, she smiled and sat opposite him, blowing across the top of her cup. Not a day goes by that I don't get sharper. How's the rest of the family? No restless ghosts there, Brock's lip tugged upwards as his heart rate slowed and he happily changed the course of the conversation. There are a few things I really need to talk to Ash about but things could theoretically be worse. He smiled. Janine started to speak, but turned back to the window a second before the sound of rushing wind filled the kitchen. An instant later a gale struck the side of the house, rattling dishes and making glasses bounce in their cupboards as a blurred shape blitzed past the window. Ash is home, Janine sighed with a smirk after the house stopped rattling. Quickly getting to his feet, Brock pushed his chair back to the table and inclined his head. In that case, I need to go talk to him. Face pleasant but unreadable, Janine nodded. Sure, I'll go check on Grant and the kids. Bowing very slightly to her again, Brock straightened up, left the kitchen and marched out the front door of the house. Before his feet a winding path of cobbled stones lead down the side of the hill on which Janine's home was built and into Pallet Town. The dozens of new buildings, most built of white stone and shining glass of all colors in equal measure, stood organized in a cleanly laid out plan on streets of the same white stone as the homes and businesses. All of the wreckage and debris of Pallet's first incarnation gone, cleared away to make room for new development, the model city of Ash's new vision for Kento sat gleaming like a gem. Brock ignored the view and followed a smaller path around the side of the house to the expansive and empty rolling hill that essentially marked the edge of the city. 
On the crest of the hill, the gym leader spotted two figures, one an enormous bird with a wingspan that must have stretched 20 feet or more, and a crest nearly that same length, and a tall man in sharply segmented armor the color of coal. Brock called out and Ash turned around. The savant smiled widely and, after giving his Pidgeot a last scratch beneath the crest, walked over and greeted his old friend with a bear hug. Both exchanged greetings and exclamations of the others looking healthy and happy for several minutes before Ash put a hand on Brock's shoulder and offered to show him inside for a drink. Actually, Brock prompted, your wife was kind enough to share her hospitality. But thank you. I was hoping you might have a few minutes to talk. Of course, Ash agreed, elated. I've meant to catch up with you for a long time. Things have just been so busy. How about we go and end? In private, Brock pushed, his tone growing serious. Ash looked puzzled. To what end? He asked. Haven't read my mind. Brock probed. Ash shrugged as Pidgeot hopped over and stuck her head under his hand for a scratch which he gladly provided. I try not to unless it's warranted. I know I wouldn't like someone rooting around in my head. I think it's warranted here. Brock said. Trust me. It's important. Ash raised an eyebrow and looked between Brock and the house. Brock, he said, let's go for a walk and you can fill me in on what's on your mind. Brock nodded and they both set off, pacing along the sides of the hills north, until they had passed in silence beyond the edge of Pallet. Route 1, now a highway paved in stone, stretched before them, forging north and disappearing over the horizon. Brock cleared his throat and looked over at his old partner as they walked. I never did thank you properly for helping me deal with that cult several years back, he said. So, thank you. Ash nodded. They were plotting to overthrow Pewter and to install me as king, he shook his head and frowned. Sad. God, actually, Brock corrected. Install you as God. I don't think there are gods, Ash groaned, his armor evaporating away from his frame like black steam, replaced by comfortable walking clothes that fell like drapes from thin air and fastened themselves around him. I'm certainly not one, and if there are any hiding out there, they're not in this galaxy. I know. Ash grinned up at Brock, who still stood a few inches taller. I've looked. Brock laughed. You can't blame them though, he said. I've seen you on mole trees. It looks like you're riding a lightning bolt of fire. There are gods from the old myths less badass than that. Ash sighed again. I don't want to be worshipped. Does that cult still meet in the basement beneath that butcher shop? Not since you set them straight, Brock answered. Good, Ash responded. Now they meet in my gym. What? Ash exclaimed, stopping where he stood. Brock, you can't encourage them. I don't, answered the gym leader. Really? He went on when Ash looked unconvinced. After you put an end to their plot to overthrow me and install you so it could start the glorious crusade, or whatever they were after, your little cult came to me and apologized for the trouble. They felt so bad about it they volunteered to maintain the gym and help me run pewter. Seriously, they've been nothing but helpful and in exchange all they want is to be allowed to meet in peace. Ash sighed a third time but relented. Fine, he groaned. Maybe I should keep a closer eye on things nearer to home. Nah, Brock said. I've got it under control. Besides, there are other places you might want to be looking right now or, if you're too busy, in the very near future. Ash looked unconcerned. Like where? He asked. Where have you been watching? Brock asked. Besides space. Ash grinned, going on as Brock's mood remained unchanged. I've been watching Celadon and Saffron pretty closely. There have been a few incidents up north and out east that I've been keeping under control, and then there's Orange. They're proving exceptionally defiant. If comically ineffectual. Hoen. Brock asked. Ash shook his head. I haven't heard from May in five years, he said. She asked me to let her run the operation and not to interfere. I snooped some Anne aside from a few local warlords giving her trouble she's claimed city after city and done it with minimal bloodshed. I haven't checked in for a while because I've been busy elsewhere. Brock, what's eating you? The taller gym leader went silent for a moment. When I was fighting at Mount Moon, Kasumi, and I were on the battlefield side by side. In the early stages of the fight we made some good headway against the opposition but then when things started getting rough Kasumi vanished and it nearly got me killed. 
Normally, I'd call her a coward and move on but once you beat Mew 2 and the monsters retreated, I intercepted a few Cerulean troops on my way to Pewter. They claimed they were lost, but I had a feeling Kasumi was trying to get me killed so she could take over Pewter. There weren't any incidents after that but I wasn't going to take chances and I hired a few members of Koka's gym to patrol my borders and keep an eye on the scene. You never told me about that, Ash said quietly. What's this got to do with Hoenn? Not Hoenn, Brock said. Johto. A few weeks back one of my spies spotted a Jotun prince by the name of Gold on my borders headed towards Indigo. That got me curious, why would a powerful Jotun noble be fleeing alone through the wilderness towards the Elite Four unless he was in big trouble? Gold, Ash noted. I know the name. The family rules New Bark Town. They were petty nobles for years but during the Cinnabar War they raised thousands of mercenary troops, but turned on the rest of Johto once the other cities had sent their armies away. They conquered half the region and used the spoils to turn their mercenaries into a standing army to keep possession of their new territory. They've since made powerful enemies. Brock nodded. I sent a few spies to find out if the Golden family had collapsed and they brought back some disturbing news. Claire. Brock probed, the gym leader from Johto who died fighting Almon Cinnabar? She was the de facto queen of Blackthorn City and her death left a substantial vacuum, a vacuum since filled by a prince from Orr. He goes by the name of Paul Rainbowing. I'd heard, Ash said. But he hasn't done anything to destabilize the region. He came to the gym and took over through legitimate channels. But he and the Golds despise each other, Brock added. They've been at each other's throats for years. The story is still unclear but something bad happened to the Golden family and rumor has it that Blackthorn was at the heart of the matter. Ash. Brock stopped walking. Or helped instigate the war between Johto and Cinnabar. What of it? Ash pressed back. Brock, that war is long over. Or lost. Brock looked over his shoulder and back at Ash. Did they? He asked. They instigated a war between Johto, Kanto, Cinnabar, and Orange, a war for which they paid next to nothing while everyone else got much weaker. Now they've got a prince in Blackthorn and control the half of Johto the Golden family doesn't. Everyone else is slowly demilitarizing, thanks to this grand piece you bought, while they're expanding and getting stronger. Cut to the heart, Ash said flatly. What's your angle? Brock stiffened. What if Orr is playing a long game? He asked, voice as low as the insects sounding all around. They've always been reclusive on the surface while never hesitating to nudge everyone else into fighting each other. Well now, they start expanding into Johto. If the Golden Family falls then how long will it be until Orr starts making grabs in Kanto or Cinnabar? If they start expanding east, Pewter will be one of the first cities on their list. Brock, Ash put a hand on his friend's shoulder. You're forgetting that if, if, he emphasized the word, they start getting too aggressive, or if they cast a sideways glance at Kanto, I'll go and have a word with this prince of theirs and all of his superiors. If that fails to turn them back, a quick stroll across the surface of a star ought to do the trick. Ask the Orange Council if you don't believe me. If someone is willing to kill people or start a war for personal gain, making an example of him normally does wonders to improve the disposition of his subordinates. If this prince of Orr tries anything, I'll stop him one way or another. Fair enough. Brock paused and thought, then took a heavy breath. It would still give me some peace of mind if you would at least investigate. The savant gave Brock's shoulder another reassuring shake. I will, he said. You all right? Brock nodded. It's just, he started, I think I'm still getting used to this new order of things. Ten and fifteen years ago, if someone on the other side of Mount Silver so much as sneezed I started worrying about Johto getting stupid. Picked that attitude up from my days at Indigo. Now, with four kids and another on the way. I think about Jenny having to fight again. I know, Ash nodded, glancing into Brock's mind and feeling the turmoil beneath his calm exterior. It's enough to drive you insane, make you want to preempt the problem however you can. He paused. I know you've seen a lot of the worst the world can offer, and Orr's reputation inspires some ill will, but let me handle it. I will handle it, all right. Ash flinched and stole a quick look over his shoulder to the tree line. He didn't need to see anyone to feel the presence there. The gym leader nodded. No problem. He said. Thanks. Ash shrugged. That's what I'm here for. I keep the peace. He slapped Brock on the back. Hey, I have someone trying to get a hold of me, the savant tapped the side of his head. Mind if I send you back to Pallet and I'll catch up in a bit? Sure. Brock nodded, I haven't teleported in years. Be gentle. He joked. 
Ash laughed and started to reach out. Tell Janine you'll be staying for dinner. He narrowed his eyes only slightly and the tall gym leader vanished without so much as a puff of air. Ash sighed and turned around, eyeing the tree line. Long time no see. He called out. I know you're there. Your dead zone shows up like a flare when I'm looking for it. No it doesn't, the ghostly voice wafted against Ash's mind as a purple miasma floated from the woods and began taking the rough shape of a truncated torso and two disembodied hands. Couldn't see me if I didn't want you to. Haunter said, tone shot through with an almost giddy glee. Ash smiled broadly and walked forward. How you doing old friend? He asked. Indigo treating you well enough. He felt Haunter's non-vocalized chuckle before he heard it. Working for Agatha now, said the ghost. Have been for some while. She wants to talk, says things moving fast are important. Says I'm supposed to work for you again if you need. Ash nodded. Must be urgent, he said, reaching out with his mind and finding Agatha, or more accurately the field of static her ghostly presence emitted, waiting for him in her chambers in Indigo. I rebuilt my grandfather's lab in Pallet. Go there and wait for me. Like old times. Haunter's red grin hovered in the air. Shaking his head, Ash looked away. Hopefully not, he chuckled an instant before he winked out of existence. His head buzzing slightly while his breath formed a white cloud in front of his face, Ash materialized in an alien room of black and purple stones and looked around to get his bearings. From every direction he heard the pulsing thrum of the refrigerated air units keeping the room so bitingly cold. A voice as cold as the chamber around him reached the savant's ears. Glad you could make it in a timely manner. Ash turned about, spotting the ghostly white woman in the purple dress sitting in the corner in a stone chair. The younger trainer inclined his head. Agatha, he said. You're still looking well. Four dead, said the woman. As a shallow smile set folds in her cheeks, her skin so utterly without color, Ash actually flinched. He guessed the old woman could pass for a statue, or a cadaver, when standing still and the thought unnerved him some as Agatha sat unnaturally still now. I see there's some humanity left in you yet, Agatha went on. My new appearance damages your calm. Not too many people can claim they've actually seen a ghost, Ash answered, a real human ghost. I'm still sorry for what the Zabat did to you. Agatha stood up then, making no sound as she did, and focused on Ash with eyes that looked like dusty glass. It was painful, indeed, she answered. That point, the final instant of life when the brain shuts down and the dark closes in, is worse by far than whatever violence brought you there. She paused and her smile grew wider. I'm not angry. In fact, I should probably thank you. Those Sabat released me. You spent your whole life around ghosts, Ash said calmly. Guess it's natural, somehow, that you would turn into one. Why keep the old body though? He asked. Why not get a younger one? He tried to joke. Agatha cackled. This old thing. She glanced down at her body. My parents gave it to me. There's some sentimental value attached. I'll keep this one till it falls apart or starts to stink, then get a new one. I have a few on ice that should work quite nicely. Again the savant flinched. You didn't call me to talk about bodies I hope. You can't have mine. I wanted to ask you a few things, most notably how you're doing, Agatha answered, gesturing to the chairs in the corner. It's been a long time, we've both been busy, and I know the last time we talked you were having some trouble adjusting. She sat down and Ash joined her. Tell me the existential angst isn't getting too bad. Ash shook his head in his chair. Quite the opposite, he said. For a few years there the synthesis really threw me for a loop. It still does every now and then. I'm still not sure if I'm really Ash, the same Ash from before the fusion or if I'm Ash and Mew too or if I'm a new thing entirely. He shrugged. Everyone who knows anything still believes I'm a fusion of the Ash that was and the Mew too that was. All I know is that I have the memories of both. Still leading everyone on? Asked the talking corpse. No reason not to, Ash answered. It's the identity I've chosen and it makes Janine happy to think I'm still her Ash. He paused. You never did tell me how you knew I was bullshitting about the synthesis. Even May, Sabrina, and my father bought it. Agatha again let slip a soft cackle. I had sensed Ash's spirit before and I had sensed Mewtwo's. Yours. She nodded to him, feel similar to both, identical to neither. Still maintaining your grand lie then. Ash sighed. I am, he said. 
To the masses I'm still just Ash Ketchum whose contact with Mew to produce the world's most powerful psychic. To my family and closest friends I'm a fusion of the two, committed to keeping the world as peaceful on the macro scale as I can, and in reality... Who knows? He thumped his thumb against his chest. I am what I am. Even if I'm not Ash Ketchum anymore, I'll play that role to keep my family happy and keep the peace. He smiled. That's what I'm here for after all. Good, Agatha nodded as if happy. Then you won't mind if I ask you a favor, to potentially help keep the peace. The psychic savant shrugged. Sure, he said. Whatever I can do to help. Sitting up a little, Agatha leaned forward and rested a hand on the table between herself and Ash. I'd like very much for you to go to Johto and look into something for me. Ash put up a hand. Let me guess, he said. The Golden Family is under attack by the Orin Prince, Paul Rainbowing. You want me to go and make sure that the violence stays to a minimum and doesn't spill over into Kanto. Agatha sat in silence for a moment, face unreadable. I thought you didn't like to read minds without permission, she said, said it was rude. I didn't, Ash answered. Ten minutes ago I was talking to Brock outside Pewter and he has the same concerns. Apparently one of his spies spotted the prince moving through Pewter's territory on his way to Indigo. Tensions in Johto are rising, Agatha answered. Quickly. Ash shrugged. I know, he answered. The Golden Family and Blackthorn have been posturing and rattling sabers for years. But Agatha... Ash rose up from his chair, that's Johto. It isn't Kanto. Beyond our borders I don't interfere unless there's a clear and obvious threat to Kanto. I can't go around deposing every petty dictator and cleaning up every glass of spilled milk. I only deter the big stuff. You made an exception in Orange, Agatha countered. That was a humanitarian disaster, Ash retorted. And it was threatening to escalate and set the Orange Islands on fire. Tens of thousands would have died, those two counselors had to go. In so gory a display. Ash paused for a split second. It was painless, he answered. And it sent a message. Indeed it did, Agatha responded. Now the Orange Islands are galvanized against you. They won't start anything, openly at least, but you've ensured that they'll never be your allies. Now they're just waiting for you to slip up. Ash grimaced. And this is supposed to convince me to intervene in Johto. I don't want you to intervene, Agatha said, an edge creeping into her voice. I want you to investigate. She paused again as Ash looked up, trying to interpret her tone she guessed. I found him, the ghostly woman went on, the king in the west with a golden spirit. The Jodan prince, Ash guessed. And a member of the golden family, quite fittingly, Agatha added. He came to Indigo asking for help ousting the Orines from Johto. Lance turned him down and he left, but not before I got a look at him. You. She said as though she meant to gesture at the savant without actually moving, still have that crown of white fire, but the Jodan bears one that shines like molten gold in liquid sunlight. I've never met someone with so fierce an essence. Ash leaned back in his chair and rested his chin on his knuckles. A crown. So he's a savant? Agatha sighed. Indeed. Bear in mind though that all those who bear crowns are savants, but not all savants bear crowns. Your daughters for instance possess no such regalia. They don't. Ash started. Hey, I didn't know that. You can't see what I do, said the crone. The crown signals something different. What I'm not entirely sure, but if I had to guess from seeing you and that May girl together, I would wager that the crowns mark subjects of the prophecy. She trailed off. So, let me just say I'd take it as a personal kindness if you would go to Johto and just have a look at things on my behalf, maybe try to keep the boy with the golden crown alive. Ash stood and dusted down his clothes. Sure, I'll spare the time and have a look into the whole thing. Thank you kindly, Agatha responded, standing and bowing her head to the other trainer. Nodding, Ash reached behind his back. Damn it, he laughed. Ten years and I still reach for pokeballs. He brought his hand in front of his face and flexed his fingers as if to confirm they were indeed empty. Keep this between you and me. Agatha's lips curled up and Ash couldn't escape the feeling her eyes would have softened if they physically could. Your secrets, great and small, are safe with me, she said. And thank you. For what? Ash asked. For confiding in an old woman, she answered. And keeping the peace. And being human. It gives me hope.
the savant mirrored her grin and gave a quick salute. It's my pleasure. That's what I'm here for. He answered and vanished. The night air flowing slowly through the window breathed across Ashes and Janine's forms as they lay atop the covers piled on the floor of the master bedroom. One arm twined around his wife, the other playing with her hair, Ash breathed deep and kissed Janine on top of her head. He didn't need the light of the brightly full moon, but the savant happily drank in how the silvery glow illuminated every flawless feature as Janine pushed herself up on an elbow and kissed him. Wholly content, he basked in the sensations. Pulling back and biting her lip for a second, Janine stole a second, much quicker kiss. Do you have to go? She asked. Ash sighed and ran his thumb down her bare back. I do, he said, voice halfway between speaking and a whisper. Agatha's information and Brock's concerns hit a bullseye. Johto and Orr are gearing up for a war. If things go bad, I doubt the living will outnumber the dead when the dust settles. Janine sighed and rolled her eyes. How cheery an observation, she said. But a true one, Ash answered. Jotuns are passionate, proud, and warriors to the core. Orines are ambitious, cunning, and indoctrinated from birth to serve their princes. Johto is divided along political and religious fronts, and historically neither side believes much in diplomacy. Fine, Janine feigned pouting, laying her ear down on his chest, listening to the rhythmic thumping. Just come home as soon as you can. Will you be taking Pidgeot then? Ash nodded. After I found her Pokeball in the deep roads I promised her we'd fly every day for the rest of her life. He smiled and his face quivered noticeably. I miss my old team. He said, chest tight. They really were the best. Pikachu and Charizard, Arcanine, Ounce. I still miss Firo and Butterfree. They were all great Pokemon, Janine cooed. I really miss Arcanine. Ash took a steadying breath. He was my favorite. He said. I hate to admit it, but that damn dog and I had a stronger bond than any of the others, even Pikachu. Man's best friend, Janine said quietly. They talked for hours after that, mostly about nothing important. Plans for the future, past dinners, trips they wanted to take, and numerous other miscellaneous topics popped up and faded away without care or concern. Before either realized the passage of time, the eastern sky had already grown light and the edge of the sun threatened to break the horizon. Well, Ash said, quite content. I should get going. He tried to get up to his feet, but Janine's strong hand locked around his wrist and pulled him back onto the pile of linens. One more, she said, purple eyes sparkling in the morning light. The Sun Soul The End Author's Note, let me say thanks to everyone reading this. Whether you've been with me since the beginning or you picked this up yesterday, through the valleys and on top of the peaks, through the good and the not so good. You all have my fondest thanks for reading. I hope you enjoyed the story as much as I did. Peace Coming Eventually Foundations of the World The King in the West End Shattered Crowns End of Chapter